The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Now my next guest is Eugene Braxton. He is a near-death experience researcher who claims that he has discovered the new near-death revelations. Eugene's out-of-body experiences began at age 6 and will continue night after night, year after year, from age 6 to 16. Let's go many years forward to 1997 after reading a Newsweek article about NDEs and writing a response letter to the article, Eugene was formally invited to participate in a near-death or personality study with Dr. Bruce Greystone, who has been called the father of research in NDE. Let's now hear the full story from Eugene. Eugene, welcome to the show. Good to have you, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Now, Eugene, whereabouts are you based to begin with? I'm in the States, United States. I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. And uh, I have, it's, has it been a nice day over there? Is it good weather? It was nice today, yes. yes. Uh, about 70. Wow. <laughs> that's, um, that's an extreme summer for us. <laughs> okay. What's well, mainly cold over there? Oh, uh, well, you know, it, 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 it has been very uh, wet uh, a couple of uh, seasons just recently, but we're now starting to see, I believe, the beginning of our summertime, which it's, uh, it just makes that difference, doesn't it, coming into the sun and uh, having the sunshine there. So, okay, well, uh, near, so you're a researcher into the near-death experiences. So let's go straight into it. And... Uh, Tell me about your experiences, of the, your out-of-body experiences from age 6 to 16 to begin with. Yeah. Um, Kevin, what happened with me is um, about age 6, I began having uh, <clears throat> dreams and lucid dreams, the kind that are, are more real than a regular dream. I began having dreams, lucid dreams, and out-of-body experiences uh, night after night. And... Uh, these three things, the dreams, lucid dreams, and out-of-bodies, were interwoven. Like I'd have a regular dream, then I'd have a, a lucid dream that was more real than normal, the kind where you're more awake in it, uh, you, uh, the kind of dream where you realize that you're dreaming. And then I would, would also have out-of-body experiences. Where I found myself floating uh, above my body in the bed, in the room, and uh, outside throughout the uh, city, you know, and in the world. Um, so uh, these started at about eight to six, and I would have a dream, then an out of body, then a lucid dream. I'd have about maybe three to, really three to six of them a night. They were one, then the other, then the other. So after about let's see, eight or nine years, I started getting really used to them, and I could tell the difference between a dream, an out of body, or a lucid dream. And um, <clears throat> like uh, I can give you an example. I would have this one dream where I was uh, either cl climbing a ladder up, up to a, a great height, or I just would wake up uh, high up in the sky, maybe like on a mountain peak. Um, once at the top, uh, I would lose my balance and began falling. I had these falling dreams uh, so many times that one time I was falling, I realized that this is a dream. As soon as I realized that, I kind of woke up more, you know, when I realized that it was a dream. I began to fly. So a dream can uh, turn into an out-of-body. Now that, that dream turned into a lucid dream where I was flying. But a lucid dream, when, when you realize that you're flying or do, doing something super normal, uh, can then turn into an out-of-body. And that's how it started. So I had about 10 years of those from about age six to maybe uh, 16. They were pretty strong the first 10 years. And then they leveled off as I got up into the 19, 20, 21. But other uh, abilities came in too. But it all started with the dreams. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And, and, and it, so let's just clear that up then. The lucid dreams, uh, are we saying they're dreams that you know are as real as life? 
you know you're, you, you know you're conscious that you're dreaming and you're conscious of what's going on around you in a sense in the dream yes yes yeah lucid dream is like when you're um, aware that you're dreaming sometimes you'll know that you're dreaming you do you don't something you? yeah or yeah. Ex- experience something so uh, different that uh, you know you must be asleep and that's uh, okay. a lucid dream has a, a higher level of consciousness than a regular dream. Like, uh, and here's a perfect example uh, for out of bodies and lucid dreams. In a uh, in a lucid dream, you will remember that dream uh, that same day, that same week, or even months or years later. Same with an out of body, you'll remember that experience. But a normal dream kind of fades away almost as soon as the person gets up and is getting ready to work. They've forgotten a normal dream, you know how a normal dream just kind of fades away like smoke after, you know, you, the alarm clock goes off. But the other dreams that are more than dreams, they stay with you. And that's one way you can tell. You remember the lucid dreams and the out of bodies. But most dreams, most of them are forgotten after the day has started. Okay, okay. Now, now, what uh, when you had these uh, um, out-of-body experience or lucid dreams, as you turn them, um, what were some of the most powerful ones? What, who did you meet? What did you, what were the, some of the most ones that resonate that, that caused shifts in your perception of reality? Um, definitely any dream where I was flying or falling. The flying dreams were, uh, really good, uh, because, um, that's something that everyone wants to do, and that's something that is above normal. Um, the, um, let's see. Did you want to know about lucid, any of these experiences or a particular one? Uh, whatever uh, resonates with you to tell us. Okay, here's, I'll tell you, let me start with the out-of-body. I would, um, like every, you've heard of sleep paralysis? Yes. Okay. Where you uh, can't, where you know, you, yeah, where you, you can't move. Is that, that what it is, where you wake up and you can't move? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the person will be going to sleep or will be half awake, half asleep, and they, uh, are awake enough to, to feel that they, they see that they cannot move. They're paralyzed. It'll take all their strength just to move one pinky, you know? And uh, a lot of times the tighter, the, the more they fight, the tighter that, that paralysis gets. And uh, usually it knocks the person out. But if, if the person, let's see, sometimes you can fight it and sometimes it's best not to fight it. But what I used to do, and this starts, this started it too. When I was a kid, in uh, let's say fourth grade, yeah, it's about six or seven. Uh, and because of a boring math class, I would look at the clock and just start doing these uh, holding my breath exercises, which were really uh, kind of like a meditation exercises. I didn't realize it, but it was a way to burn the, the class through. So I started doing these breathing exercises, and it, it seemed then to help me be more like awake and, and clear. And it was a way where I could uh, burn through the class. So I kind of began doing uh, breathing exercises as a kid. And uh, when I got older, I continued those all through the teenage years. I, didn't, I knew that they helped me uh, with health and sports. You know, they made me strong. And I had more air in my body. So, um, but also what I didn't realize was those breathing exercises would open up those psychic doors, really like barnyard doors. The the, uh, the breathing exercises uh, opens the person up fully to uh, becoming more psychic. That's the really the fastest way a person can be psychic is just doing the uh, breathing meditation exercises. And um, so I use them for sports. But at night, those breathing exercises, which I did when I went to sleep, uh, gave me super clear dreams, made me more awake during the lucid dreams, and made me more awake during the out of bodies. So. Um, it really all starts with those breathing exercises. And, and that extra air in the person's body um, gives them a higher level of consciousness. They're more awake. And that, that will happen whether they go to sleep or if they're just up in the daytime uh, doing the breathings. But that extra air um, opens up uh, a lot of things uh, spiritually and psychically. So that's where it started, and those breathings helped me become a lot more awake and aware during the uh, out-of-body streams and lucid dreams. And But getting back to the out-of-body, I had been, um, went to bed, did the breathings, and uh, 
and um, you know, normally uh, the, normally felt the paralysis, paralysis coming on. Now, everyone doesn't always feel it. Sometimes maybe they might feel it once a month, once a year, or once a half a year. But everyone on a, everyone has had at least one experience that they remember of being paralyzed and uh, not being able to move. And um, that paralysis is the first symptom of an out-of-body experience. The body is temporarily uh, paralyzed so that the spirit body can float up out of it. And it took me a while. The, the same thing as with the dreams. I would have repeated out-of-body experiences. So I, and I was awake because of the breathing exercises. Right. So I got used to... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no go ahead, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got used to uh, watching what was happening uh, as I went to sleep. And um, the breathing exercises kept me awake as the outer body would begin. And it began with the paralysis. And I was awake enough, like you're fully paralyzed, but you can see and you can hear. I was awake enough to uh, see myself come out of the body and feel it too. And it would, my, my, my spirit body would come up out of the body go near the end of the bed where my feet would lie, and then stand upright there. And um, <clears throat> there's only one other uh, person. Now, a lot of people write about out-of-bodies and, and, and uh, have had them, but the only researcher who I knew who had the same kind to the T as me was a guy called Sultan Muldoon. And he was a, a, an out-of-body uh, expert in the 1920s. He's pretty popular. And he's really, if anyone wants to read about out-of-bodies, he'd be the best one to read about uh, Sultan Muldoon. And so I saw, uh, as I grew up and studied these experiences, that he was the only one who I, re who I knew who had the same kind and as many as me. So uh, he was very good. And um, But so the out-of-body, uh, the, um, it's, it's the astral body or the spirit body comes up out of the uh, physical body. Uh, right it, now, usually the person is deeply asleep when this happens. In fact, most people come home from work, they watch TV, and then they go to bed. They're so tired that uh, it's just like a black wall, you know, a black uh, room. Uh, they don't even. Uh, a lot of people don't even remember their dreams, and even more don't remember the paralysis or uh, the out of body experiences. And I would say, out of body experiences, the. Um, the main reason for the, uh, the spirit body or the astral body to have an outer body is to recharge. Like when someone's sleep, uh, when someone's sick, they'll get extra sleep to um, you know get better, and that so their spirit body can stay out of the physical longer, and it recharges in the air, in the prana, as uh, the Indian uh, uh, mystics say or call it. And uh, so when that spirit body comes out of the body comes out of the physical, it recharges in the atmosphere. It also goes about and does its own thing, too. Um, usually uh, during an, out of, an unconscious out-of-body where the person doesn't realize they're happening, sometimes the astral body will act out the dream. The astral body, too, has uh, uh, a few different levels of consciousness, uh, levels of awareness, how awake they are. I used to, Kevin, I used to have out-of-bodies where I'd be flying in midair, but almost fully asleep, <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's uh, the levels of consciousness, uh, how awake the person is during the experience, whether it be dream, out of body, or lucid dream, is really uh, a key to those breathing exercises and the levels of consciousness. So, but the breathing exercises, all the extra air, helps to keep the person more awake during these things. Mm -hmm. My, 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 that's... Uh that is so uh, incredible, um, what you're saying here. So, so um, we're coming up to an ad break soon. I'm just a bit conscious of that, and uh, that we will have to stop in a second. But um, So there's all these places to go to when you leave your body, and you've done it in a sense where you've been consciously aware of uh, you know, leaving your body and, and, and traveling. Um, where did you go to? I mean, did you get to meet dead relatives or what was there where did you go that's that's a good question a lot of times um because of uh, uh the interwovenness of dreams uh, lucid dreams and out of body sometimes uh, 
uh, the person. It's, it's really it's, it's it's possible to go anywhere. But uh, there were times when I would, and this gets into the, the category of dream control, which comes in naturally with all those things. After a while, you get so used to it, and you can kind of control your dreams. So I would program myself. I would drift off to sleep with a certain uh, location in mind or a certain uh, event to do or a place to go. And if you hold that thought in your mind as you're drifting off, it you kind of merge or, or you kind of like, walk right into the dream. Okay, then. Like that. Okay, then. Well, Eugene, we're going to take a quick break there. And after the break, I want to get into the, the dream control just a bit more because that is fascinating. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The Moore Show website. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm currently joined with uh, Eugene Braxton. Uh, now, he's a near death experience researcher who claims that he has discovered the new near death revelations the world authorities have been waiting for and we're going to get into that in a minute but first of all Eugene welcome back to the show thank you Kevin now just before the break there we were discussing the idea of controlling uh, your your dreams and you know knowing putting I'm guessing putting a key message into your head just before you go to sleep that would allow you then that as you go into a deeper cycle of sleep to have control and to take control of your dream. Yes. Incredible. Yes, Ken. Yeah, um, when the person, uh, just like you said, programs or, or places, a, or it, uh, really holds a visual image in their mind as they're sinking uh, deeper and deeper into sleep, um, especially if they, with like a breathing exercise uh, or some kind of like... Uh, you know how they used to say that you would, when you go to sleep, you count sheep? Yes. Okay, that's kind of like, a, that kind of a visual thing is, is keeps the person's mind awake as their body's falling asleep. And um, when the person has a, a dream image in their mind, uh, let's say, let's say a, a flying dream, the person, uh, as they're going to sleep, pictures themselves flying. And uh, they, they actually... Uh, try to feel it too or they do they, you feel like uh, let's see you uh, say you want to have a flying dream what I used to do I would uh, as I'm going to sleep imagine that I was going into an elevator and I would get in the elevator or like climbing that ladder like I mentioned before I would go ascend upward and then at the top of the uh, of the elevator or of the ladder I would then um Remember, well, like with my uh, flying dreams, uh, the repeated flying dreams, I would climb, climb this ladder or go up in an elevator type thing to a great height. And then I'd be up there stuck. Or I'd look back and the ladder would be gone. I'd be standing on like a trapeze type of thing. And uh, eventually I would fall off. And I, I would, this happened so many times, I, you know, it became a flying dream. But the thing is to just place, uh, have a certain visual image in your mind as you're going to sleep. Could be, you could be playing a sport. I used to do that. I imagine myself, you know, running track. And just hold that in your mind as you're going to sleep. Here's a good uh, uh, thing that the listeners could try tonight after, when they're going to sleep. Um, like there's a way where you can spin yourself into a dream. Like if you imagine you're on one of the playground equipments, like the, the thing that goes around and around, the kids sit on and goes around in a circle. I don't, I'm not sure what they call it in Europe. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, America, not America, round, but... Um, Similar, yeah, I know, I know yeah. what you mean, yeah, yeah. And you run, you push it, and then you jump on? Yeah. Or you can just uh, imagine that you're standing still and turning around in a circle. You can literally, and then if you hold like an image, certain a street corner in your mind, and, and while you're going to sleep, you get the feeling that you're spinning around and around and around, and you have a destination that you want to go, like say a street corner, a certain street corner you want to go to. You can literally spin yourself into that dream, 
and and stop. When you stop the spinning, you can literally be at that place in the dream, but you'll be uh, it'll be a lucid dream where you're awake. Um, but let's see, but that lucid dream can also turn into an out of body. It's right. like the three the three of them dreams, lucid dreams, and out of bodies are kind of connected over yeah. like doorways. Yeah, abs- absolutely. But um, with with what you've you know experienced as well, um, again you 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 mentioned before that you you had you gained psychic abilities, uh, which increased in power as you grew older and and um, you know you you know you were able to have more control. Is that right? Yeah, um, just like a in a powerful dream experience that someone's had has can uh, increase the uh, psychic abilities, or if someone wakes up. During an out-of-body experience, say you're floating or flying, and you wake up and you realize that you're out of your body, you look down, you see your house or you see your bed, that, too, uh, will give you um, psychic abilities. Anytime your uh, spirit body is out of your physical and you realize it, you'll uh, receive some of that cosmic energy and uh, a lot of times cosmic knowledge. Um, And and that's what you gained as well, wasn't it? Cosmic knowledge. Cosmic knowledge, cosmic energy, and the psychic abilities, yes. Mm-hmm. I used to have this, I used to want to uh, uh, learn things, and there was this one level, I called it like a level, there was this one place I would go to like learn things, and I would be taught things that would be uh, communicated to me um, subconsciously, and I would later remember it consciously uh, further a few months, a few weeks, or a few years down the road. And so they would uh, teach my dreaming mind, my subconscious, or my spiritual mind. And then later, when I was awake, in time, I would remember, when time was right, what uh, what they had taught me. Right. And uh, I used to call this the learning level. And uh, in, the learning, in that level, like where you go to just get pure knowledge, you... Uh, you can see figures, but you can't see the details. Well, that's what I was going to say. I'm, I'm, uh, who are they? When you mentioned they taught you, who are they? <laughs> I, I just seen them as friendly, um, uh, wise angels, or some people call them spirit guides. Uh, as I grew older, that that might have been like a young person's view of them. Yes. I knew that back then. I knew that they seemed kind, and I knew that I could learn stuff from them. But as I got older. Uh, I saw those, that same experience in uh, an adult way. Like now, and I still, I still see them as uh, helpers, teachers, and advisors, but I kind of realize now what they really may have been. And, and what's um, that? Well, as the talk continues, I can get, get into that Okay, more. okay. But, uh, and and at the time when you was having these experiences, did you ever tell your parents? I mean, was could you share this with anyone? Did you understand that it was a near death experience, communicating with what could have been classed as you know the afterlife? I um, most people uh, when they have the near death experience, and I kind of had I had mine at fifteen, almost after nine years of all this other dream stuff. It was almost as if the dream and out of body experiences were. Uh, it's almost like uh, the near death was a graduation present for all those years of the out of bodies and dreams and lucid dreams. So that kind of prepped me for the the near death, which is a spiritual out of body. And um, so at, at 15, I had the near death, and by then I was very well used to the out of bodies, lucid dreams, and dreams. Um, so that was like a graduation present that near death experience. Did you think you was going mad sometimes? During the dream, well, I. I, in junior high school, like uh, middle school, I didn't like uh, the paralysis. I no. didn't like the nightmares. No, that's terrible. I didn't like trying to run in a dream and feel like you were running in uh, quicksand or tar. You know, have you ever had a dream where you're Oh, many running? a time. And, and I, I, I always have those dreams where I'm running and, and I know something's chasing me. I don't know what it is. And the time slows down, the floor's grabbing me to to not be able to run at the speed I should and I come out of it thinking well, what, what was that about what, what why am I always going through that yes and like you said you said a good thing the time slows down that's another uh, kind of difference in the uh, 
in that those dreams and uh, out of bodies. There's a different time. It's almost like the time is different. That's one way that the person can uh, realize that they're in a having some kind of spiritual thing, like uh, say an out of body. One way to t- or a dream. One way to test to see if you're having a lucid dream or an out of body is to just simply jump in the air off the ground. And if you come down slowly, you're it's more than just a dream. Mm-hmm. But why do, why do we why do we run? I mean, you know, why don't we do, why do we not be why are we not conscious enough just to say, okay, I'm going to stop, and whatever it is that's chasing me, I'm aware this is a dream. I'm going to wake up. It's um, but we don't do we sometimes. Sometimes we don't. There's been times where I've uh, had to turn around and face the monster or attacker when I was young or whoever it was chasing me, and then when I like one time I did, and then the thing just kind of dissolved, shrunk, and just disappeared once I faced it. But in real life, when we turn around and face those kind of things, it can be dangerous. So that's probably why we don't try it in, in, in our dreams. Okay. But uh, the nightmares, I didn't like those. I didn't like the paralysis. I didn't like the falling dreams. I wanted to be normal like the other kids. <laughs> I would, t- <laughs> you know, I didn't want to have those nighttime things happening. But uh, there were also on the s- same side, there were also daytime things happening, too, where it kind of crossed over, those experiences crossed over into, like, the uh, the waking life. And uh, the waking life and the, the dreaming or psychic life or the nighttime spiritual life is they're related, too, like a brother and sister, night and day. And usually once you get one, you'll have the others. Mm-hmm. Like, if you start having uh, powerful dream experiences... Uh, it'll show up in your real life, just like they say. If you have a dream, a dream of uh, like I used to have future dreams. In future fact, that dreams. Happened. Yes. Mm-hmm. That my, came true. My my mother used to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they did come true, um, which was the scary thing about it. Uh, yeah, future dreams. Um, have, have you had those? I have. I have. And, and what in have you fact, dreamed of the future? Well, I used to have. And I used to do a lot of sports. So uh, I lived in Ohio at one time, and they have a a lot of uh, waterfalls and lakes and floods. So I was also on the swim team, so I was a good swimmer. I used to have this, uh, while I was on the swim team, I used to have these dreams of drowning, of my legs being stuck or tied up and, and bubbling underwater, even though I was a good swimmer in the swim team. And we used to, there, uh, we would have a flood in Ohio, and we would go out during the flood and swim, you know, in the flood. We used to go to... Uh, uh, the waterfalls during the flash flood and swimming. So that's how good we were. But so I couldn't. When I was on the swim. I couldn't figure out why I was having these dreams of drowning when I was a good swimmer. And we, and we were taught. I played water polo too. We were taught to swim with one, just one hand or one leg. And so uh, I kept having these repeating dreams of drowning and of being my legs being stuck. And uh, that dream turned out to be uh, how I died in a lake. I drowned in the lake. And those were warning dreams of a future near death. Although I just I thought that I thought that it was because of the blankets being wrapped up around my feet, and uh, I used to, you know, I like it warm when I sleep, and so I thought, well, my legs were in the blanket, so I dreamt that I was drowning. So, you, so this is, you, you you think this was a future dream that you had, you you've had of some place in the future where you you might be in some sort of accident? Is that what you're saying? That 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 you've, yeah. You, well, the uh, when a person has a future dreams that come true. They're usually repeating dreams. They're usually short. They're vivid. But but, but this this has never happened though to you. Not before. No, this is my first main future dream. Yeah. But but it, but what I'm saying is, hasn't it, this this future dream has not occurred as of yet? Oh, we, with the drowning? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that's when I was 15. Oh, but what you yeah. did you you were involved in an accident? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Right. Before the near the, before the near death, I had. And I, my near death was a drowning. Before that, I had repeating dreams of, of being dr- of drowning, and then I did drown in real life. Right. Okay. So, so let's let's move forward to this. And so, so you were. At, what, what what was the incident? Was it a car crash or something? Or, or you? you well, uh, my near death was uh, drowning in the lake. Drowning in the lake. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know whether you was in a car or something. Or is this, I mean, how 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 did that? You, how did you end up in the lake? Could you not swim or? I, yeah, well, no, I was a still I was a good swimmer then. And this was after those repeating dreams of drowning that I just thought was something else. I um, I would dive in to water during swim meets, but because of an ear infection, 
in my free time when swimming, I would like to jump in feet first, so I wouldn't right. hurt my ear. Right, right. So at this lake, we were uh, at a church youth group picnic. So we were out in Ohio, and they had this dock. So I ran and jumped up high in there and went straight down like a diver with my feet first. And I got stuck in the muck underneath the... Uh, oh, gosh. About you know, 15 feet underneath the water. And I got stuck up into the knee cabin. Wow. And uh, the, that's that kind of that's where the legs being tied up, uh, the dream of my legs being tied up, and I couldn't move my legs and drowning. I was stuck up into the knee, uh, the right knee. And I could not get out. I used all my strength and couldn't get out of that muck. So, and, so uh, you did drown. You, I mean, you know, you you, uh, you left your body. Is that what is that is that I, the next event? Well, yeah. I um, what happened with that? Uh, I, I got stuck. I could not get out, I struggled, and it was like tar, and uh, I waited for a while, I held my breath, I waited for a while, because uh, with those breathing exercises, I was able to hold my breath for a long time, but I waited for a while to, for someone to come down and get me, no one ever came. Um, after a while, I couldn't hold my breath anymore, and I let it go, and I, I quickly sucked in what seemed like a trash cans full of water at once, so much came in. Within seconds, or min- uh, within seconds, just like they show in the movies, I was floating, you know, full of water, floating, and uh, starting to uh, stiffen up and uh, become paralyzed. You know, you'll see them, like you see them in the movies, where they're floating and they're, you know, they're full. Okay, anyway, Eugene, we're going to have to take a break there. I want to get back into this straight after the break, and I want to know okay. where you went and who you met. So stay tuned. Uh. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The Moore Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Welcome back to the co- the show. I'm still currently joined with uh, near-death experience researcher Eugene Braxton. Eugene, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Now, Eugene, uh, okay, so you were had the, had the accident in the, in the lake. You were drowning. Um, what happened next? Okay, yes. I had these future dreams of drowning. The drowning did occur. Um, jumped off the dock with the uh, feet pointed down, went straight in, got stuck in the muck, and then uh, sucked in the water. Uh, became full with water, and the, that's when the paralysis started to set in. And uh, let's see, fell down on the lake's bottom because I was stuck in it. Looked up for a a, a while to see if anyone would dive in and come and get me because I was still awake and stuff. Although I, my lungs were full of water, I was full of water, but I was still awake. Could see, I could, I was couldn't move. Um, as the paralysis came in uh, more and more and more. I could still feel stuff. It still feel see. Um, so I fell down on the lake's bottom, and uh, this is when I did actually start to die and did die. So I was I was paralyzed. I could not move. Um, the lake. It was summer day, but the lake bottom was so cold that I was shivering, and uh, being paralyzed and shivering. And uh, I could feel in my body uh, the different organs, especially from the neck to like the waist, those main organs. I could feel them slowly shutting off, just like little candles, like the kidney and uh, the liver. The, lungs. I could feel each one going out like a little lamp. And I knew I didn't have too much time left. Um, still no one came. Um, <clears throat> I became fully paralyzed and immobile. I couldn't move at all. I could still see. I could still think. I couldn't move at all. Um, um, I couldn't move at all. Um, then, um, after a while of extreme pain, the pain just clicked off. Right. Um, and then there was no pain. And you hear about these people having near death, and they have a peaceful feeling before they die. They're not afraid. They're not in pain. That's what happened. All the pain went away. 
Uh, I was still awake. I was not in pain. I was still paralyzed. I could still see. Could not move at all. But the pain was gone. Was, was you was gone. you was you enveloped by a tunnel? Like they talk about a, a tunnel or, or and, and being that's, drawn to love. That's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing about the death process because it is a process. There's certain things that happen, and it happens like in an order. So we had the paralysis. Uh, we had the, the the pain and the uh, fear that stopped. When a person knows that they're going to die, uh, they instinctively n- they, they instinctively know I'm dying. When I felt those organs shutting down, I realized my body is dying, and so and no one's coming down here to get me. So I'm going to I'll probably die too if they don't. Someone doesn't come down quick. That's what I was thinking. And while I was thinking, I could feel the organs shutting down. Uh, the pain stopped. Everything stopped, and I felt ah, I felt good. I felt it felt good. The pain was gone. It wasn't even cold. But um, <clears throat> and then uh, the only thing I could hear, Kevin, was the heart beating, and I could see. Those were the only two uh, things left. Um, and I could hear the heart beating slower and slower and slower and slower until like maybe the beats were maybe eight seconds apart of the heart. I knew it was going to stop. Suddenly it did stop. And um, when the heart stopped, I heard like a loud boom. It was almost like a garage door being slammed shut. And then everything went black. And I had died. Um, <clears throat> a short time after that, I kind of popped awake. I woke back up. And um, I had been used to that from uh, dreams and out of body. You could, you can be in a dream and uh, realize something, and then uh, just appear somewhere else. Like um, whenever your level of consciousness changes, so does your the location. Uh, so does the location. Uh, let's see. Whenever your whenever your your level of consciousness changes, so does the dimension or location, or space where you're in changes. Um, but getting back to the uh, the drowning, I suddenly woke up, and I didn't realize I was outside my body until I looked down and saw myself in the lake. I thought I was just, I thought I was myself waking up. I looked down and saw my dead body in the lake, and then I realized, oh my God, I, I, I died, but I, I'm alive again. So when I looked down and saw my body, and I had been used to that from the out of bodies, I realized that I was dead. And um, I was glad that I was alive, but I knew that I had died. Now, right after that, and and there was a lapse in consciousness where, um, like I was talking about the dreams, you just suddenly appear somewhere else. Right as I realized that I was um, alive again, I noticed my body. It was going through several different changes, which I put in the book. And um, I, once I noticed the, the, the way my body changed, the way my spirit body was changing, and it went through several different changes before it stabilized, I, um, I was just in a, a room-type setting. Now, yeah. and what, where I had gone was to have my life reviewed. You've heard of that? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, so that's where you went. That's where I just appeared in, yeah. You just appeared now, in, No, I'm yeah. not... Yeah. I just was there. I don't know if... Well, anyway, I was just there. So, in like dreams, sometimes in dreams and things, and, and, and maybe we can talk about later the, the lapses in consciousness. In, and I was... So I just appeared in this life review room. It's a, it, uh, it wasn't really a room as much as it was a, a review. Um... What they do is, what I saw was, I saw three uh, giant what would be plasma screens to us now. And uh, in each screen were different uh, things that happened to me in my life. One screen was everything I ever did. And these were visual moving picture screens, almost like in a kaleidoscope way where you can see the images kind of, uh, like when you shuffle a deck of cards, you can see all the cards almost at once. Wow. And I could see... uh, Everything I did, everything I ever thought on another screen, and everything I ever said. Everything you ever thought. Everything I ever thought, yeah. And it went in a, uh, it went in a, let's see, 
it went in a kind of like a, a multi-dimensional way where you saw everything at once, kind of like the deck of cards image. We can see all the cards uh, just, uh, you know, uh, being shuffled by, you know, like when you shuffle the cards and you can see them all yep. at once. It was like yep. that. And uh, I could see all the three screens at once. Also, there was a another moving a band of images that went around that, and they were showed other things. They they showed other things in my life, like they showed um, the, the effects of what I had done, how it affected the other person, or what I had said, how it affected the other person, and I felt it too. Um, and here's an example: one time I, I threw a rock at a kid in camp, and um, in the near death, I saw that uh, replayed, and I felt the rock hitting me as it hit him. So everything that was done or was said, I felt how the other person reacted back to it then. So you you you, you live through the exact things that you said or did or uh, thought about anyone else. You live through that. And uh, so I was, I could feel what they felt. And uh, it was just interesting. And, and, and you see all these things in your mind all at once. Because it's your mind, it's the, your mind's kind of receiving it. And it's, a lot more aware and uh, open than your conscious mind. Your your subconscious mind is higher and can receive all those multi images at once. And um, you actually feel them too. Like in in those higher worlds, hmm. uh, you feeling is important. Like you, it's almost you can almost see the truth better if you close your eyes than if you look, because uh, there's a lot of illusion that occurs in those higher worlds. Um, and as well as dreams and out-of-bodies, too. So the person uh, has to uh, be able to distinguish between the illusion and the reality. Just like in an out-of-body experience, when the person is paralyzed, some people report that they that, uh, things are sitting on them or that uh, something's crawling up in the bed. And um, when people have out-of-bodies, out of, uh, when people have the sleep paralysis, that's, that's a normal thing. And uh, let me just... Sleep paralysis, let me just read this to you. Sleep paralysis may be also accompanied by hypnagogic, hypnagogic hallucinations. These hallucinations can be auditory, tactile, or visual. So um, there's a there's a, uh, uh, a middle part of the sleep paralysis where people imagine that they're seeing things that aren't really there. Okay. And you when do. they break out of... Okay. I'm sorry, Ken. No, yeah, no, I just want to... Fascinating what you're saying, and I know we're so limited by time. That's that's yeah. there's so much to, that I, I, I really want to get <laughs> yeah, sort of touch okay. upon. But yeah, no, I mean, I mean that that time spent reflecting on on what you did to others and how that made them feel, and vice versa. Um, yeah. That must have changed you as a human being. I mean, when you because when you, obviously you came back into your body after after the uh, you know. But I mean, how how did that change you? Did uh, it? Um it made me it made me more aware of what I had done, just seeing it um, seeing it happen and seeing how it affected others, how they felt about it, you yeah. know maybe I was had cursed at someone or or you know how kids are, and I was only fifteen, so it wasn't too much bad that I had done. I was a normal kid and but seeing it uh, just opened. Uh, me up to it made me learn more about myself has has right. it has it made you in your adult life to be more percept perceptive on you know being careful that what you say to yes. others and how you treat them because you know, yeah. you know you're 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 thinking of of them more but but in a kind of way as well when you were when you was in that room it it must have been a sort of symbolic to see that how we're all connected as one perhaps you know that what you do to another you really do to yourself yes you do yes you do and, uh, and and it's also recorded too. The things it's that you do. It's recorded, yeah, exactly, and, and 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 not a plasma screen that we're probably used to, but that's the best way for you to, to sort of describe the experience as a, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and other other near deathers have reported seeing like a screen type thing, yeah. but the main thing is that you see it in your mind, whether it's on the screen or just in the air or in spirit. You you see the images of what you've done to others and how it affected them, what you thought, what you said, yes, and what you did. Yes. And, did, uh, did you get to meet anybody else in the room when you? Were, I, I mean, after the, ref, the, the, the you had the reflection, uh, self reflection on, on 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 your life up to that point. Did you get to meet anyone else? Was there anyone that sort of greeted you? Did you get to speak? That's a good question. 
there was a, a, a presence there, kind of like uh, overviewing and asking me questions. In fact, there were three questions that were asked. There was a presence there that I could feel, but I could not see it, the presence. And the uh, world authorities wanted to know about that, to ask that same question. They said, uh, who is with you uh, in the life review uh, room? Was it the God, the angels, Jesus, or some other? And um, that, um, with mine, it didn't, seem, it didn't seem to be God, but it seemed to be someone of, uh, in between God and, and, uh, and myself. You know, someone of a high authority. And... Uh, like, you know, uh, other other people, uh, someone might see Muhammad, someone might see Buddha, but there was some kind of judge there. It may have been God, too, but he would come later. But there was someone reviewing me, and it, some people even said it was themselves reviewing themselves, but I don't, I can't tell if someone can review themselves, you know. But it, is, is it, isn't self-reflection the worst kind of reflection? The worst kind? It can be, yes. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I mean, who, who can ju- judge ourselves, you know, more than we can, in a sense. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're judge, jury, and execution there, in a, in a sense, even though there was no punishment for anything. I mean, do you think the reflections... I mean, I'm conscious of an ad break coming up here right now, so, you know, we're just going to take a quick ad break, and I've got many more questions right after this. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm still joined with my guest here, Eugene Braxton. Uh, and we've just been discussing his near-death experience. Eugene, welcome back to the show. Thank um, you. It's an honour to have you here, actually. This is a really um, 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 interesting recount of your, uh, of your, of your near-death experience. Um, you know, we had a text in from uh, a guy called Jamie just earlier on about uh, whether the soul continues or not um, uh, when uh, when you pass on. And, um, you know, I've always believed it does. And from what the experience that, that you've had, which was, you know, real to you, uh, it surely does and, and did carry on. And, and of course, you've, you're, you're here to tell the story uh, when, you, when you came back from your near-death experience. Um, yes. And, y- you know... It, 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 I, I guess all sorts of possibilities, you know, become become uh, apparent that they p- perhaps you know there is such thing as past lives as well that that, that we you know, you know we 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 carry on and we can come back and um, I think this gets gets into the, the, some of the work that you've done as well. Um, but before we just get into some other areas, let, let, you, you mentioned um, to my producer as well that um, you've discovered. The new near-death revelations the world authorities have been waiting for, and, and, yeah, and, and, and you yeah. mentioned that you've been in contact with some, you know, big-name people. Like, uh, was it? Oh, I'm, I'm just. This is what I've been. Is it David Cameron, uh, Bill Clinton, and, and and some other big, 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 uh, big people? I, I spoke with uh, David. I talked to David Cameron. Um, Clinton helped with. Uh, Letting a lot of these big people know, he he was Clinton was a Facebook friend, and he saw some of the research and 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 told and told the others. I had people like George Bush trying to be my Facebook friend, Supreme Court Justice John Roberts, Margaret Chang, Bill Gates. They came to me to friend me. I was like, this is the last time I, I couldn't believe it, and. Uh, you know, I had had some movie stars, but with people like that, you know. Well, well how, how how had this occurred? I mean, obviously, they, they must have, what, they heard of this story? They, they what, what? On Facebook, some, I'll, I'll post a lot of the, uh, the near-death and UFO stuff on that, and they, they saw it through there. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Huh? Well, I mean, I mean, um, that's, that's fair enough. Um, well... And and what was the response? I mean, what 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 did um, 
What were the what what were these new near death revelations? Well, um, and I did want to say something about uh, I, we can get back to the life review, review again. Um, but one thing about that, and, I'll, and I'll, then I'll tell you about the web. With a life review, it's like God shows the person everything that they did, so then when it's time to judge them, they have nothing to say, because he replays it for them so that they remember what they did, and then the judgment can be fair. So that's one of the reasons for the life review. God goes over everything that the person said, thought, or did, and uh, uh, asks asks them uh, about those things and if they could have done them better. Like, uh, one of the questions they asked me, there were three questions, and I'll, I'll get by this real quick. They asked me, um, what have you done to help others? What have you done to help yourself? And, uh, let's see, help others, help yourself. There was one more, but they asked, um, what have you done for others, what have you done for yourself? There was one more, I'll, I'll, it'll probably come up, but they, there were three questions that were uh, introspective. But God shows, God allows the person to have the, the life review so that they can when it's time for him to judge them, and he does, they can have no, uh, you know, they, there can be no backsass about what they did, because he just showed them, to them, you know, all their experiences. That's like a little uh, a little thing with the life review. He shows you what you did, so when it t- comes time for the judgment, you have no excuse. And this is especially for the real bad people, you know, say like a Hitler. <laughs> well, uh, okay then, so... so uh if I just kind of quickly summarize what you're saying, is that there there is a, there is different levels. Is that what you're saying when we pass on? So if someone f- that, that that's done harm to someone else knowingly, um, how how are they dealt with? In your opinion, they are just like it says in the in the uh, the Bible and the religious books. If the person, uh, what I've seen and what I drew from all this, if the person believes in God, um, that's his sole requirement. If, if you believe in God, then Everything else can be forgiven, and just like they say, it's, he seems to almost be uh, like a jealous God. He is alive, and the world is alive. Like when I first uh, had the reconscious, I, I had when I uh, regained consciousness after death, I could feel the the heart. The world had a heartbeat. The universe had a certain heartbeat, like a throbbing. That was a, exactly the uh, in tune with my own heartbeat. So the heartbeat that I had was in tune with the world. It's like one one whole heartbeat and you're connected uh, with that so you could feel like how, how alive the world was but um i'm sorry kevin your question was about yeah no i w- um i cannot remember what my <laughs> because my, my, my head's racing around here just trying to th- just to just to keep up with everything um what 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 the revelations that uh, that's they were right, the revelations that's it yeah that they were checking out and that they liked. I was able to, uh, a lot with the near-death experience has to do with what the person remembers. And just like in the dreams, there are certain, some lapses in consciousness. Like you'll hear people say, I had a near-death and I, uh, I saw a light or I saw the white light. Uh, I had a sense of floating out of my body. Uh, I had a life review. And uh, even further, crystal cities, cities of gold, meeting Elvis and then puppies and stuff like that. Uh, or other people, and uh, I can believe the other people, but a lot of that was p- pure illusion. In the near-death experience, uh, it's it's laced with illusion and reality, and so um, and it takes time uh, after that to to separate that uh, illusion from reality. If the person even can, sometimes the, like uh, sometimes the person really thinks like the Eben Alexander. <laughs> He recently wrote a book where he was flying on a, uh, a butterfly with a Marilyn Monroe type uh, blonde looking at him. That was pure illusion. It, it was real to him because those illusions that you have in the spiritual world are so powerful that they're more powerful than anything that we'll experience in this y- real yeah, world. Yeah, I've heard that before where, that, where, you know, you, where you've traveled across to, if you want to call it home or when, however you want to personify it, that, that it's, 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 it feels more real than being here on planet earth you know in, in this incarnation yeah but 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 just getting back to the revelations i mean i'm okay. I, I'm, um, okay, I'm, um, I'm i'm um okay um i'm that but i i didn't quite get the revelations uh, yeah. that, that, that you've there was uh, a lot that uh, the near death researchers up until now uh, even now uh, didn't know um they weren't sure of a separation of the spirit body from the physical body at death 
uh, Charles Tart, the, who is the world authority in levels of consciousness, said himself, we're not even sure what consciousness is. So they didn't know uh, if there was a separation of the spirit body. That was Dr. Ken Ring. Uh, they weren't sure about levels of consciousness. They didn't have any near-death experiencers who even really remembered the reality of what was really happening. Yeah. Only one in four remember anything. And a lot of times that's like a blurry f- a fragment of some uh, sounds, images, fleeting images, murky. Uh, um, there was... they. They didn't have anyone who... Uh, there was a lot of memory problems, like memory retention, memory recall, the accuracy of the memory. And uh, uh, there was a, 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 a lot of the near-deathers. And it's, it's about... what The field is about 35 years old. They weren't uh, experienced uh, with spiritual things, like out-of-body streams. Like you might have a truck driver who had a near-death who had never had one before or never even had a dream before that, you know, was a lucid dream or more. So they they had inexperienced experiencers having near deaths and then reporting uh, a lot of times falsely what was happening. Um, after all the I had about ten in my life. Well, in in those ten years, six to sixteen, I had about ten thousand out of bodies, about eleven hundred or nine hundred between nine and eleven hundred a year. So the out of body was my specialty, and I was able to see. Uh, see the reality of the near-death, what it really was, than uh, most of the other near-deathers they had seen before. And that's why Grayson was kind of excited uh, when he, uh, when we met. And, yeah. Uh, he felt that I would be able to remember more. And I would oh, I see, right. More. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you seem to be, I mean, you seem to have this gift since a young age of, you know, having these out-of-body experiences and obviously having your near-death experience as well. Um, you, you, you seem quite a unique individual in, in, in that sense. Um, but I still, yeah. I still, I'm sorry, but I'm still not getting, getting to what are the near-death revelations that, 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 that you've, you, okay. you, you've, you've, you've discovered? Well, um, so here's some of them. First of all, if the near death has a certain order, a certain uh, pattern, a certain structure, just like everything is, even the de- dying to death process has a certain order, pattern, structure. So, so does the near death. It starts with a person coming out of their body. It uh, after that they regain consciousness after death. They wake back up. Um, there's a life review, as a judgment, um, resurrection. There are changes in the spiritual body as they go through these higher levels in the near death. And uh, so, let's see, you have the, and I'll run it down, you have the, um, yeah. you have death itself, which is an actual stage. And that's what, they, they, so these are the revelations we're running down now, yeah? These are some of them, yeah. Yeah, some of them, yeah. It, yeah. And so they, they, they didn't know the order of the near death. What happened when, they knew it had certain stages, yeah. but they didn't know if there was any order or, or even what the stages were. So some of the stages are there's death, yep. there's reconsciousness after death, yep. there's a life review, okay. there's a judgment, um, there's a white light, yes. and uh, there's a resurrection, there's a mixing and merging with God. Right, with person. right. So I see what, you, what you've done here is you've broken them down into stages. There are stages, yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't. I'm not too sure if I like the stage of, of, of the, uh, judge, the the judgment, the judgment, or the the, the sort. That's of, a, yeah. Well, well, actually, that's the easiest stage. It seemed like it's right. the most frightening, yeah. and it's the easiest. Okay. And uh, just like uh, there's a with when death comes, the person when they struggle for life and death, the person is filled with primal fear. Yes. Like one of the same with paralysis. You have that primal fear. Yes. And you're afraid because uh, you want to get into heaven, but you know how you've been, and you're not. The person is not. The person is afraid of going to hell. But well, do, do, you, do, you, you, do, you, do you believe in hell? I believe more in hell than a devil. Yes, but uh, a lot of that is like a mental. Ah, a right. mental thing. Right. So, so what? Um, yes. Yeah, so, what you're saying there is that you you create Kevin. your own hell. Say it again. You, you, what you're saying there, I think, is you know, it, it, it's not a, not an actual hell as you understand it. it, it it's more of a, you know, if it, you would create your own reality, you create cre- you create your own reality when you pass on. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. There is a, a judgment, 
and they're um but with God it's like if you believe in him then all those things can be easily forgiven. Right. And and, and, and like you said, there is a little bit of uh guilt and, and self uh judgment that the person has. And um um but um I've heard of near deathers who had bad near death experiences and they have literally gone to hell. But that going to hell part, that, uh, remember I was talking about the hallucina- hallucinations that people have during par- paralysis? Yes. Usually that going to hell part happens when they are uh, 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 having the paralysis stage of their out-of-body. Like when they die and their, and their body separates from their spirit body, separates from the physical, that's when those hallucinations come in. And if you have guilt in your mind then, you're going to really freak out. So, uh, in that paralysis event, there is a, a, a section where the person is, depending on their state of mind, is, they can imagine all kinds of things. Yeah. And if, if they're dying and they already think that they may be going to hell, yeah. that'll just boost it to the extreme. So, um, a lot of that has to do with that, those hallucination, hallucinations that the person has during the paralysis. Because after they... Um, after the process is over and the, and the spirit body is out of the physical, they go on with the life review and the judgment and all that, too. But it usually occurs during that paralysis. And that paralysis runs through a lot of spiritual events, not just a near death. It runs through it. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many uh, things it runs through. It's, that's a common factor. That's a common pattern, that paralysis. But we'll, we'll continue on with where we were going. But, so, but, but, uh, but did you feel, yeah. w- when, when you... When you passed over, did you not just feel unconditional love? Um, yes. Yeah. There was um, there was a stage, the forgiveness stage, forgiveness and the judgment. Stage. Right, right. Yeah, there was a stage of forgi- forgiveness. Where the person, and with with mine, and really with all of them, the person is first forgiven. God forgives them first, and then He judges them. He is so good that He can forgive them for what they've done. But they will and must be judged, and that's when the again, the, and and there's a mixture of primal ecstasy, which is a level of consciousness, and primal fear, which is a lower level. There's a mixture of primal ecstasy and primal fear during that judgment and forgiveness stage. But 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 um, but is is there wrong and rights when we pass on? I mean, I, I I interview a lot of people who say that there is no wrong and right. That you know that 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 actually works. There's always, there's always a wrong and right. Like, no one can get away with everything, like a Hitler. And the person do, you, do, you, will, do, you, do you think, yeah. though, that if someone's committed murder, rape, or any of these vile things, right, what, what if they've... And they still believe what, in God. What, what if, in a sense, they, it's, we, we, we take uh, roles when we come here, roles uh. of things that we, we're going to experience and, and do. What, what if some of this was preordained? Then why would they be judged? Um, you know, I'm just throwing well, it out there. Well, mainly because of free will. Like when we're here, you've got this free world, will. So you, what you're saying, you've got free will not to do it. You have free will to not do something. Yes. And when the person exercises their free will, uh, if it goes against God, then they'll have to pay in some kind of way. And sometimes the worst torture can be mental. Okay. You know. Okay. Well. Um, y- after the break, I'd like just to uh, continue where we left off, and uh, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Well, this is the last uh, final part of the show now. Uh, Eugene, welcome back. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, One question I've got for you straight off the top of my head, Eugene. Are Are you a Christian? Um, yeah, we were raised Presbyterian, but I believe in God. Um, yeah. So, so you had a religious context before the near-death experience. Yes. Yeah. 
know. Yeah. Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, some uh, some people have, that uh, you know have had near death experiences uh, were never religious in, in, in any sorts. Um, but the you know the, the experiences all seem to be the same. This this go into a place of a life review, the unconditional love, you know, meeting relatives, uh, yes. spending hour days what which we uh, in this place called it home. That's just for a context. Um, and what only would have been seconds of, for the time that you know of the the event as it unfolded, you know, with you drowning. Um, so, um, did you get to speak to anyone or see anyone about future events when, when, you, when you crossed over? I did. Um, they told me the reason why I was to come back, because um, I wanted to stay just like the others. And they said that in the future I would have a son that I had to come back for and take care of. And, and did you? You had a son? No. Okay, okay. Also, you know, there's um, a couple of things I wanted to... With the... Um, there's a, here's an interesting thing. It only takes like a, ten seconds. With, when the judgment occurs, at least with mine, and with others I've heard too, and, and see, there's a, a point where the person is levitated in the air about the height of a telephone pole or a tree, and uh, their arms are outstretched, just like Jesus was on the cross. And the person is held in midair like that, and then God comes to the person. And the world authorities were uh, concerned. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but the world authorities were concerned about that kind of control. And uh, at the end of the near death, we uh, uh, looked into what they call the controller, who controlled the near death. There was, there was a lot of free will, but there was also a uh, complete control, like with the paralysis and the levitation with the person. And I think uh, there may be a picture there, but the person is held in midair with their arms straight out when the judgment comes. And uh, the person has a mixture of primal fear, because God's coming once and for all to deal with them, and of primal ecstasy at the same time, because if anyone can get them out yeah. of the jam, it's God. So, so did that experience happen to you, Eugene? So, yes, it did. And 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 uh, did you get to meet God? Met him, mixed in with him, uh, merged with him. Like it's uh, like with the merging, one is done physically, and uh, melding is done mentally. So you get like a total immersion. You 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 meld I, mentally. Well, so so when we say you met God, so sorry, I just want to. Um, are you saying uh, it, it was a physical being, or, or or was it more of an energy? Both, both. Like in, in these in these kind of things, you can have there is like maybe no one uh, certain thing. It can be interwoven, and and also it can be interwoven with illusion, where the person thinks they're seeing an, an old man sitting in a chair, but it's something else. Usually, children have those. But uh, mine was a, a, a meeting, meeting, seeing him, and the, the God, the image of God, will come. In the way that the person will recognize it. So, when it's, when so it comes God back comes, to that, it comes back to that thing, though, doesn't it? Of you create the experience you want when you cross over. Um, you I saw God in the image that, as you understood, but someone else could see it as a woman, uh, uh, whatever yes. deity. I mean, you, you could look at all the deities in some of the yes. Indian and far and Eastern religions. You know, they have gods upon gods upon gods. And yes. no one's going to, seems to agree in all the religions that, you know, our God is the God. But yes. you manifested right. the experience that you felt comfortable for you. Yeah, well, when I looked mine up, mine uh, was in the uh, Muslim. The Muslims saw the same images that I saw, you know, when I saw God. And my, I'm black, so it, it might have been the, a heritage or genealogy thing. Yeah. Because mine, and mine, mine fits the Christian, Jewish, and uh, Muslim afterlife. Uh, it's parts of all of those in it. Well, can, can, um, I, can I ask you something, Eugene? Yes. Um, you've, you know, you've met the God entity, the source, as, as such. Uh, um, but do you feel that you came from that source, that, you, that, that your soul came from that source? So, 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 there, therefore, is there any, if you came from that source, then, is there any separation between you and God? Are, are you not God? 
no, no, no. There's a god. There's a definite. But 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 if you but but if you came from that source, is is that not you? No, that's like a father. We're we're from them, like his children. But we're definitely we don't. He's way too expansive for that, you know. And um. You know, I've, I've interviewed people. It's a separate where, 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 entity altogether. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. interviewed people where they say that you know, um, actually, we're here having an experience for God on on its behalf to you know to to learn core things like love and forgiveness and everything else. Be, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is just what they've told me. And um, but that you know, in some form, they all seem to tie in together with what you're saying. Um, and it's and it's and it's uh, you know, again it's 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 the experience that you had. Um, I mean, a person like a person, uh, a person is themselves, and then there's something else. Like a person can't be something else; they can only really be themselves. And we can, like we, if I were God, I could not make myself. And there's there's a, an actual real God who's alive, who lives, who has feelings, and who has good forgiveness. But then, what is not God? I only concentrate on what is. <laughs> but what is not God? You know? I, I, I mean, if God is everything and every and everywhere, then everything's God, isn't it? You, everything. Well, we're part of Him, but we're not Him. Just like no one can, you can uh, mix into God or merge with Him, but you can't. You can know Him, but you can't. You can know of Him, but you can't know Him. You, can, you know, you can't know the mind of God. It's just, it is the human mind. Hmm. It can only go so far. Okay. Like, okay. You know. You, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't uh, understand. I there's understand. there are limits. Just like uh like we rely on God to get us into heaven or to send us you know, to get us into heaven. We can't get ourselves in. We couldn't even resurrect ourselves or regain consciousness. That when we come out our that's an uh, it's an uncontrolled out of body when we uh uh leave our when our spirit leaves our physical body, uh that's not under our control. We are like raised up out of ourselves, and um, just like in that movie, The Exorcist, when the priest makes the little girl float in midair, or not him, but the power of God, the power of Christ. They say that's this. There's always an outside control or controller. Uh, the humans only have a certain amount of control. They have less than they think, but they're more than they think too. But there's definitely a separate God who rules and, and rules supreme. That was the, probably the main lesson. I and he's judgmental as well, you say? He's, he's, he's a jealous God. He has feelings, passions, and um, anytime something... But, but, it, but, it, but is that, does that come from love, though? Love, is, that's, that's what God is love, yeah. Yes, but if God is love, then he's not jealous or, or, or vindictive or, 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 or needy. Not things. vindictive. Love is, love, he, love is unconditional, if, isn't it? If the person says that they... Uh, if a person did not believe in God, they probably wouldn't even regain consciousness. The person, the belief in God is uh, a, a prime. You will not. You, the, I've, I've, we've learned okay. that you will, the person won't even regain, like suicide uh, uh, yeah. victims. They don't even remember a near death. Suicide attemptees don't even have. You know, that's just black. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get back to the NDE because um, I could probably sit on this subject for way too long, and it's. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's interesting. But let's there's, there's so many levels of, of your work, and let's just go to, to one of them right now, which is the UFO research. How did you get into that? How is it tied to the near-death experience? Well, I never did say it was tied in, <laughs> although it is. Um, I um, I work at I used to work at Temple University, and uh, it just so happened that the World Authority in UFO Studies worked here too. You know? Right. So, I saw some. After I finished my near-death research, I saw some uh, anomalies in it that uh, were suspicious, were interesting and uh, suspicious. And like I said, there was a lot of illusions in it, a lot of things that uh, were mirages that the people really didn't even see. And there was a. It was mixed, mixed with. Uh, Reality and illusion, heavily mixed too. And there are some things that I wanted to run by uh, someone with some new UFO knowledge, and uh, Dr. Jacobs, who was uh, 
teaching at Temple happened to be the World Authority. It's almost as if he were, we were meant to meet. World Authority, right there, a building away, and I was working on uh, my research. So I went to him and uh, studied with him for 12 years, one-on-one. He was the third World Authority. I also worked with Dr. Grayson, the near-death, Dean of Near-Death Research, and PMH Atwater, a female who's the number one World Authority now. And I continued on with uh, Atwater and Jacobs because the uh, the near-death research and data that I had simply went above Dr. Grayson's head. Now, Dr. Atwater, the female, she had she had died three times, so she was more in line to understand where I was coming from. Yes. And um, I had enough things to ask Dr. Jacobs and to show him that he invited me to uh, study with him, and it lasted for 12 years. And I'm still in contact and study with Dr. Atwater, too. So uh, those two, uh, I switched over to them. It began with Dr. Grayson, and because uh, he was like he was like the Baron Frankenstein of near death, he was the top man. He had the PhD, you know, psychiatry, and he edits the Journal of Near Death Studies. So he was the big one who brought me in to the International Association of Near Death Studies. Then I switched over to Dr. Atwater, who had, herself had died three times and knew she could uh, understand my language better than he could. And she was a more likely, <laughs> more better, more suited mentor. And Dr. Jacobs was great, too. And I learned a lot from him and had a lot to ask him. I, I've had some UFO experiences and have the scars to prove it. Yeah. But um, all, all of these experiences are tied in with uh, uh, one another. And when... when uh, See, with the researchers now, they're all specialists in their own field. The out-of-body guy doesn't know nothing about near-death. The near-death guy doesn't know nothing about UFOs or lucid dreams. And um, so what what I dealt with was uh, all of them all together. And they're all, there's a lot of similarities and patterns within, within all of them. And luckily, I was able, and I had the experience, and was able to get with these world authorities and learn with them and dialogue with them and, and see what was really happening. We came out writing a book, and I have two books, in fact, that has some amazing stuff in it. And it, uh, uh, but the, the uh, there's so much to it, especially with the illusions, what people think they see, what they don't see. Absolutely. Primal fear, Absolutely. primal ecstasy. Ecstasy, the primal ecstasy, where some people call nirvana, that's an illusion and a big one. Okay, but that, what, what, that comes after the near death. Eugene, you just mentioned your books there, and, and you, do, you, do you have a website? I do. It uh, should be in the. Um, I think it's on the uh, bulletin board, uh, Joanna. Um, it's on your web. It's on your website. Oh, okay, so uh, so the links are all there on, on our website. Okay. Yep, yep, yeah, my, my producer's just nodding at me to say that, that, they, that they are. That's fantastic. Okay, so if, if people want to get in contact with yourself or look to see more about your work, because we've uh, come up to the uh, top of the hour right now, so we're just at the end of the show, uh, they can find more by going to themoreshow.co.uk. Um, well, Eugene, I would just like or to they, say... Sorry, or they ahead. can yeah. catch me on Facebook, too. That's a good place until I ah, get... Yes. Uh, Right, mm-hmm. so, and and well, uh, we'll link the link your Facebook into our website, so we'll we'll get that sorted out, so we can come the links on there. So Eugene, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very very interesting. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was good talking to you, Kevin. You're a good interviewer. I appreciate know. that. And you know uh, a lot about the subjects. Well, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's been an interesting one. So thank you and God bless. Okay, well, uh, we'll put the links onto the uh, More Show website uh, just after this uh, show's uh, finished. And I um, just want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll be back on Monday at 1 o'clock. Until next time, take care. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website.